I'm Dr Sarah Coop. I'm a former GP and working as a medical educator and an executive coach, also doing some work with you as a Shapes trainer. And yes, I'm delighted to be here with you today. It's wonderful to have you with us, Sarah, because whenever we get together, we <laughs> always end up having these discussions about how do we set boundaries? How do we say no? And I remember quite recently you telling me about this new model around limits and boundaries that you've been working on with people that just seems to land really well. I thought, oh, we need to talk about that <laughs> on the podcast. So before we go into that, just tell me a little bit about sort of your journey into this sort of work. What, what interested you in this in the first place? So my backstory is that I have suffered with burnout. Even though I teach on it, I um, freely admit that I succumbed to burnout, not succumbed to it. I certainly experienced burnout. Um, and I think I've had a lot of learning from that. And one of the big pieces of learning for me was recognising how hard it was sometimes to say no and to really find um, you know, find what my limits are and to stick to them, Just, you know, despite knowing, as I said, knowing kind of what I know about it. And I think I think that's sort of helpful sometimes to recognize, you know, how do we put it into practice for ourselves? It's often a bit like us as doctors, isn't it? We know how to be healthy, but yet sometimes we struggle to do the things that keep us healthy physically. And so that's some of my backstory is sort of having trod that path of, of burnout and then taking the learning from that, I think, to sharing my insights. And I know it's different for everybody, but really sharing my insights in the people that I'm coaching or running sessions with. As you know, we do a lot of work with people in our workshops don't we and around saying no and around what stops us mm. but I guess before you even get to saying no I think a lot of us struggle with actually knowing what to say no to or even knowing that we need to say no in the first place and I was interesting when you said just now oh I succumb to burnout as if and then you corrected mm. yourself to yes. you, oh I experienced burnout because at the back of our minds we feel that burnout is somehow meaning that we've yeah, succumb to it. We've been weak enough mm. to to get ill, et cetera, et cetera. Where, whereas we all know that burnout is a workplace disease. And yeah. we've got one of our slides in our training, haven't we? That if you put someone who has very high resilience skills, if you put them in a, uh, a very, very toxic workplace for long enough and keep them going at it and at it and at it, then they will burn out as well. So it's not a question of succumbing. No, so it's a question of if it, if it happening if there are no limits, if there are no boundaries. And I think mm. one of the things I guess I've noticed with people that do burn out and I'm, I, you know, I always think, have I burnt out myself? I think I have. I just didn't recognize it at mm. the time. And it was a long chronic burnout. It wasn't just a bump, massive, massively, oh, I've burnt out. But it was just over a series of many years and many months, particularly when I had small children, is that my experience of, of myself and also you know doctors and particularly professionals in high stress jobs that do burn out is that one of the reasons is they are not recognizing their own limits mm. and they are still carrying on thinking they're a superhuman and it's it's not because they're vain or because you know they have an inflated ego it's just conditioned into us through our training that we are somehow different from other people whereas everyone else has to have breaks and can only do a certain amount of hours without needing to go to sleep for some reason we are different so this is deeply ingrained stuff how do we mm. help ourselves actually recognize that, that we have any limits it's a really good question I think there's just one thing that really stood out to me was that we can just keep going and keep going and keep going until we can end up at that place of burnout and I was reading something that was saying about how our awareness can be blunted and the person I was talking with was saying it's a bit like somebody who can take a lot of alcohol and they almost don't feel the, the effect of it but actually of course it's causing that toxic effect in their system and would have you know significant impairment if they would try to drive but they don't feel um, drunk and I think for some of us it's almost like our awareness has been blunted so we don't notice the signs that are showing us that we're in danger and and so then we ignore those limits and ignore and then don't set boundaries as a result and I think you know that can be really true that sort of sensitivity to recognizing and I think on my for reflection for myself I think I I did notice some signs but I almost had that blunted awareness because like you say it's, it was a period of time it built up over time and one thing I often think about is that we can we, we get so used to living at that full stretch capacity that we don't notice it that is the new no that is the normal for us it's not a new normal it's a chronic normal for us and anything less than being sort of overstretched doesn't feel right somehow um and so we can almost seek the overstretch unconsciously sometimes because that's what feels kind of comfortable on some level but not comfortable on another and I think we can have this tension going on all the time I completely agree with you and 
I know that in the past, when suddenly I feel that I am on top of my workload or I've got stuff done, I suddenly feel worried. <laughs> like, yes. What if I miss then? I'm not feeling stressed and nearing burnout. Have I just completely missed the fact that there's all this to do? Um, mm. And you're right, because we have been working at that pace since we qualified. And, and yeah, I think a lot of us don't know what it's like to not be on the edge mm. of burnout, which is, God, when you think about that, that is really depressing yeah. state of affairs, isn't it? And it's not, nothing to be boastful about or to pat yourself on the back about it's like honestly what do we think life is about Mm. what do we think life is about is it about living or is it just about racing at 100 miles an hour so we can get to retirement age and then just collapse Mm. because we've been so stressed for so long I think that's so true and a big piece of learning for me is being around recognizing that I am a human being not a human doing and again I'm so used to being a human doing that I didn't know or I'd forgotten what it felt like just to be and so part of me recovering from burnout need, was that I needed to learn how to be and I, one of the silly things in a way that I started doing was setting myself a timer for five minutes and just sitting and being and not letting myself do anything which sounds really ridiculous in some ways but I challenge the people listening to say do that just try sitting for five minutes and being and you think of course that'd be that'd be fantastic but actually there's an impulsive like you said there's an impulsive sort of drive like I should be doing something I should be doing something. And so I have really trying, I'm really learning to stretch my being muscle and slowing down enough just to be present. Um, So that's been part of the learning for me, as well as recognizing and embracing my limits and learning how to, yeah, handle those. Yeah, it's amazing. In in one of our communities, we sometimes do just a two minute silence of just sitting there and everyone goes, oh, that was lovely. That was lovely. And thinking that was two minute silence. That is totally doable for everybody here several Mm -hmm. times a day but we just don't do it do we we don't give ourselves permission to do that so you've got this interesting model and you were waving your hands about with a with a rubber band at me okay so tell me tell me about how you conceptualize of helping us work out what limits because I think when we think about limits we often think okay well your limits are sleeping and perhaps a bit of energy but there are other there are other limits I think that we Mm. don't think about as well yeah I think this came to me so I often like kind of like say conceptual ideas of illustrating things often something comes to mind when I'm sort of reflecting on it or thinking how to teach a concept and so it was quite a while ago we were talking about limits and then you've talked a lot about embracing your limits and I was sharing with a coaching client of mine who um, is a doctor and she really didn't like the thing the thought of being limited she just had a sort of a reaction to that which was interesting we explored that so when I was trying to suggest to her you know about embracing your limits there was a real sort of pushback and so I was thinking, and I think we had a brief conversation you know, when we met her once, and, and I thought maybe rather than just embracing your limits, maybe we need to think about embracing our capacity and frame it that way. And actually, she responded much better to that. And so then I con- continued thinking. And what I came up with was um, a little sort of, like I said, concept. So if you're listening and you want to draw something out, maybe it's helpful to draw a square. And so your square represents your capacity. And each side of the square represents your limits. And so your limits spell the word team, T-E-A-M. So T for time. We all have a limited amount of time. We love, we'd love to have more, but we are all actually equal on that. E is for energy. So we all have a limited amount of energy and we choose where to spend that. And we can break our energy down into physical energy, emotional energy, mental energy, spiritual energy as well. A is for attention. We have limits on, it's a a fallacy that we can multitask, isn't it really? You know, we can really only put our attention on one thing at once where we put our focus. And then M is for money. Most of us have a limited amount of money. And so I was just sort of thinking and sort of talking with the person I was coaching about the fact that, yes, did she agree that we have these limits? And yes, she did. So then it was a sense of, okay, we have a limited amount of, of these things. What do you want to put in your square as your capacity? And then as I thought a bit more, I thought about circling or squaring the the square with an elastic band. So if you imagine putting a pin in each of those corners and then putting an elastic band kind of around the corners and recognizing that when we stretch any of those limits, I I was showing you, wasn't I? I waved my hands about, as you said, you know, with elastic band, making a square. If we stretch time, imagine that corner being stretched out. It really distorts the square. And so, yes, we might fit more in our capacity and be able to do more with our time, but the, the, the problem is the, the stretch on us and how that feels. And again, we might choose to do something or say yes to something that really stretches our energy 
and pulls us out again of sort of um, you know, that, that comfort position. And really, and it's not that we shouldn't stretch our comfort zone, but it really pulls us into discomfort and sort of on the Yerkes Dodson curve, sometimes down that right hand side, or we overstretch our attention. We try and sort of manage too many things, um, and that really affects our concentration, our ability to make decisions, um, to make decisions well. And, and for those of us working in healthcare, it could affect our ability to actually make good clinical decisions if we're overstretching our attention. So, yes, money can be overstretched too. And it's important to look at that and, and think about how you know we use our, our money wisely. But particularly when I'm working with people in this, this sort of field, it's, it's really our time, our energy our attention and recognizing I think with the elastic band going around the edge of that square and thinking about how the square can get distorted really gave me the idea that you know how am I feeling right now if I say yes to that that request or that um, invitation or put extra things in my diary is that going to stretch my time my energy my attention and is that a good stretch or is that actually an unhealthy stretch? So that was one way of looking at it. And I think the other thing was, what do I actually want to choicefully put in my square that is definitely in there? And what are the things that actually I want to put outside my square? So it's a bit like your zone, you know, the zone of power, isn't it, in terms of what's in our control and what's outside. But this is more about your choice in that. What do you choose to do with your time, your energy and your attention? So I don't know what you think about that, Rachel. I, I love that concept because as you were saying that, I was thinking, oh, wow, that is so important. It, it's reminding me of the concept of the gas burners, which um, I don't know if you've heard before. I think it's to do with energy. It's sort of, I think someone once said, you've got, I think, three or four gas burners in your life. One of them was work. One of them is family. One of them is hobbies, something mm. like that. And then they said, and you can only have two of these gas burners on at once. You've only got enough gas for two of these gas burners. So you can do work and family, work and hobbies, or family and hobbies, but you can't have all three. Now, I hate that. <laughs> you <laughs> want all three. <laughs> there might have been a fourth. I don't know. Maybe there was a fourth. Uh, and I'm sure people can write into me and tell me if there's a fourth one. I hate it, A, because I'm number seven on the Enneagram mm -hmm. and so I love freedom and so I just wondering I'm thinking about your coaching I'm thinking mm. I bet she was a seven because sevens hate the fact they think they've got limits yeah and are constrained well, by anything yeah because if you're constrained I don't want to I don't want to be constrained but if you say well I've got only got capacity that is much more freeing really so mm. limits is very negative isn't it and it's it, it, it means that I am constricted but if you talk about capacity then it's I can choose what I use that capacity mm -hmm. for. And that's much more freeing. Uh, and I prefer that to the gas burner thing, because actually I might want a little bit of family and a little bit of work and a little bit of friends. Mm. So I think maybe friends was number four. That was it. Friends, family, work and hobbies. You can't have all four. You've got to choose three. That yeah, well, I would disagree with that, that you can. And it's yeah. just how you choose to use your resources, isn't it? Your, your limits to, to make that happen in a healthy totally. way. Totally, totally. But then if I'm thinking about what stops me saying no, I do have a little bit of guilt around saying no and a very over-responsible gene, but there is a thing about FOMO, you know, fear <laughs> of missing out. That sounds fun. I'd love to do that. But if I'm then thinking, actually, what is in my capacity and I'm weighing up that thing I'm just about to say yes to with something else I'd like to say mm -hmm. yes to and thinking, well, actually, if I was going to choose between thing A, which yes, sounds great now, or thing B that I really want to do, but I've just said yes to thing A because I haven't really been thinking about it. Mm, that mm. I'm saying no to thing B actually I'm, I'm thinking about what is in my capacity that I actually want to do mm -hmm. and that is that is a lot better I, I think it's a little bit like money you know when you are deciding yeah. what am I going to spend my money on well if I spent it on that I can't have that it, it, that's a yes. very very black and white thing but we fail to think like that about time energy or attention mm, and that's what I think I was where, where I think my, where my thinking went sort of over a period of time when I was mm. pulling on this was around money and recognizing because I had to do a little when I took some time off being burnt out and and had a bit of a change of career I had to do some thing, thinking around money and so because I was conscious of like how much are we spending what are the direct debits what are the savings it actually made me apply the same questions to my time energy and attention so if I choose to spend my time on that what can I not do? And how do I make some time savings? How can I make things more efficient? What can I automate? And, you know, we talk about that. I mean, what can we delegate? But also, you know, with my energy, what, what and who will be a deposit in my energy bank? What is an expenditure in my energy bank? 
Um, how can I save some energy? So sometimes, you know, deciding to sleep longer, go to bed earlier can be a way of saving energy. Yes, it's less, there's less sort of time, isn't there? But so it's those sorts of things. And I think having the same approach, and I sometimes ask people this, if you were overdrawn financially, how would you get back into a balance, financial balance? And what would you put in place going forward? And I suppose burnout is overdrawn probably in time, energy and attention, those three other areas, isn't it? Um, and stress often is because we're overdrawn in those things if we feel overwhelmed. So how do we use the same approach that we would use logically and analytically to get our finances back on track that we can also apply to those other sometimes less tangible? There isn't um, we haven't got an app that we can go on that tells us our, our time balance is well, a calendar does. But if we, you know, we log on to our banking apps, don't we? We see how healthy it looks. But maybe we don't check in with ourselves. Actually, what's my energy balance like, my attention balance? And as you were saying, Rachel, choosing between two different sort of options that you could spend your time and energy and attention on, probably you knew you wanted to do one of them and the other was kind of because you liked the idea of it. But actually, if you weighed it up in that way, what what insights would that give you? I'm just thinking, Sarah, what's going through my head, and I can imagine what's going through a lot of the listeners' heads, is you know okay I would love to be in that position where I can choose what I spend my time on Mm. or when I can choose what I spend my energy on but I don't have any choice um I'm stuck I have to do it um and then as I was thinking that I guess I answered my own question and I'd be interested in your thoughts because I was at a point a few months ago I was feeling really overwhelmed and someone got my diary and they said right okay we're going to cut out half of the what's in your diary I said I can't I literally I just can't and she looked at this stuff. She was like, well, what about that one? That, and I said, like, oh, and she said, yeah, you can. And mm. when I did, that, the person say I had to cancel an appointment or whether the person was totally fine about it. Or I said, I can't do that. Can I push that back? Can I change this? Nobody batted an eyelid. Mm. Nobody did. And I think there is, some, there is something around keeping your commitments that you've mm-hmm. said you're going to do. And I, I feel very strongly about that. Although I think I need to do a bit of work about that because... Side note, I was talking to someone recently in the car who told me, oh, I used to have a coach and whenever they didn't have enough energy to see me, when, whenever they knew they couldn't be perfectly present with me, they would just cancel our coaching appointment. And I was like, that is just not on. I know, I could, I'm seeing your face now. I'm seeing <laughs> I mean, your like, face. I wouldn't do that, but maybe, why not? Well, <laughs> she really challenged me. I was like, I said, that is so unprofessional. She said, why if she knows that she can't be at her best and she hasn't got the energy and capacity to coach me she would just called she would she was so boundaried well boundaried and knew herself so well she said no I don't have the energy but then I said but I would expect a professional to manage their energy so that they were able to see mm. me right maybe that that's my it. answer to yeah. that but then it's like well actually how often we know as professionals mm. there are times when you've had a such a dread you know you're seeing patients seeing patients seeing patients and there's a couple that do take up a lot of emotional energy and you just feel completely wrung out Mm. and it would have been much better if you said actually I cannot do anything more now I can't see Mm. anything so I I don't know and I'm still struggling with this question of because I firmly believe that your yes should be your yes and your no should be your no and once you've said yes you commit to that but actually, if we're saying yes to everything and then feeling we can't possibly let people down mm. because of our own internal integrity values, well, then we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Mm. What do you think? I hear you. And I think I've, I agree with this sort of if I've made a commitment, I will see it through. I, but I do also think there's some journey and like you said, some work to be done on this because maybe it goes back a step to what do I say yes to in the first place, mm. knowing my capacity so that if I have said yes, I am likely you know, I, my heart is in it. I recognize I have capacity. And therefore, in order to honor that commitment, I've then got to filter out other things to be able to do those things. So it's something about sort of simplicity. And I suppose also there are things where I say yes to it and then I get to it in my diary. I'm like, oh, I really like you say it. almost with the coaching that I don't have the energy for. I'll still I'll still do it. But I suppose then I try and think what stopped me? Why, why did I feel so overstretched at that point when I thought that was going to be OK and try and learn from that and put things in place? I do think it's challenging, though, isn't it, with the healthcare situation and, and seeing patients when it, it would be very hard, wouldn't it, to feel like we could say to a patient, oh, I can't see you because I don't have the energy. I suppose we we professionally want to manage again. It comes back to managing our energy and our attention so that we can be as present for patients as possible. I think the challenge is that often we feel very overstretched with the demand. 
Mm. And it doesn't always feel like, you know, that we can control that. But I think we can control our attention sometimes. I don't know how often you caught yourself doing this when you were seeing patients, you know, we would quickly check our NHS emails or, you know, a phone between patients and that would really affect our attention or our energy yeah. sometimes. Or perhaps we wouldn't take the breaks that we needed and then you know, those, so there are things we can do, even if it feels like we can't say no to an immediate demand. Yeah. In fact, I was coaching somebody who, uh, again, was a GP and was feeling so strung out on their on their days on call. They said they really struggle with the days on call. And actually, they, they couldn't control the workload of what came in. They couldn't control the way that the surgery was doing the on call. But actually, we we looked at what then they had to do in the evening and what was happening is that they were going home to being tea bath bed with the kids etc cetera, etc cetera. and by the end you know by the time they got to nine o'clock they were apps just had nothing left in the tank mm-hmm. and we talked about making the simple change that actually they had an agreement with their partner that on the Wednesday say it was a Wednesday on a Wednesday that um the partner would be responsible for tea bath and bed Mm-hmm. and the, this GP would go swimming on their way home. Yeah. And then when they got back, kids would be in bed, they would have a, a quiet meal, and suddenly the day just got 100% better. Mm. And, and that was totally fine, and they were just feeling a bit guilty for letting their partner do stuff, but, you know, totally fine, yeah. right? We all, we all know that's absolutely fine, and it's about planning, and that really transformed things for them. So that is a really good example of, of controlling controlling yeah. what you can isn't it and recognizing that I suppose I'm showing I'm showing you my square with my elastic band mm. obviously listeners can't see this but I guess at the end of that uncalled day the capacity for time was really stretched the energy and her attention was all overstretched wasn't it so she needed to bring that back in by doing this by swimming which gave her I suppose the chance to kind of come back down to a more sort of a resourceful state and there's some research talking about the third space so that we all need that third space, don't we, between work and home. So the swimming was giving her that. Um, and, and so for some people, it might be the commute home. It might be that actually you don't have much of a commute. So then you need to create something and you go in your garden for a bit when you get in or you go for a walk. Or you know, if you've got children, it, it isn't easy to create a third space if you are sort of going straight back into that. And I, I know what that can be like. But there is something about intentionality, isn't there, in creating that third space in order to bring back our overstretch to a more resourceful stretch otherwise we're going to snap literally aren't we and I've had that moment when you know get in from work and the kids are clamoring yeah and I was just thinking you know both you and I largely work from home I know we're sitting at you know I'm sitting in my office you look like you're sitting in your living room yeah no it's my office office. as well garden office your office but often I am I just work right up until I have to run and Uh get the the food ready or, or something like that actually I could quite easily stop 15 minutes early. Mm. The person that's keeping me working is me. 15 minutes early, go make a cup of tea, sit in the garden for Mm. 15 15 minutes. It's giving, I think buffers is really important and creating that third space buffer where you can just unwind and reflect. It Um, is, that margin, isn't it? So I think the whole thing about this square is about and obviously we, you know you have a shape that there is a square and we talk about that don't we but this this square is I suppose around you know what what, how much capacity do you have? And everyone has a different amount of capacity. It depends on your life stage, your other sort of commitments, your responsibilities. So just sort of defining for yourself, like how much capacity do I have? What are your priorities that no matter what you will say yes to and that you actually, they help to manage your time, your energy, your attention in a positive way. And then also leaving some space in that square. So again, you know, how much space do you need? Some of us need more thinking space. I'm definitely introverted and need that space to think and that time to just reflect. If I don't, I know that overstretches my energy and my attention. And so, yeah, just recognizing what out of these four sort of limits, how much do you have of each? And then how a bit like, again, the bank balance, how much do you want to spend? And how are you going to how are you going to spend it? And I think just accepting that it is limited, but in a like I say, reframe it as this is how much kind of how much budget I have mm. can be really helpful. And there are things that can that we can do. So I don't know if I was to ask you, what is one way that you might spend your time? So you're spending the time, but actually it gives you back energy and attention. One one way that I like spending my time is yeah, I like I like I got, got quite into growing flowers in my garden and that is mm. that is nice the other thing is I do like seeing friends for for coffee or brunch and that really does re-energize me but it does have to be the right <laughs> the, the right, right sort of friends doesn't it because like you said connection is good 
for humans, but not all connection is equal. There are some, there is some connection that you will have and you will feel mm. that will be a net drain on your, your energy and your capacity. So you do need to just be a little bit mindful of that. It's not, it's not never see those people. No. It's just maybe budget, budget some energy and time doing something else that, 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 That's that builds thing. you up that balance and and I think another bit of learning for me from from burnout recovery was around pace and balance Mm -hmm. so if we're working at a very intensive pace you know we need to then intentionally set things that balance that that out so yeah so it's again what can you put in your square that's a real really you know priority that you're definitely going to say yes to what are the things that are going to actually help to keep you in balance and then outside the square what are the things that probably are the things that stretch you and it's not saying we should never do these things. We have to, you know, work does stretch us, does stretch our time. It does stretch our energy, our attention. Um, but, you know, how then are we going to then bring that back in? Then that's the balance bit. And so there's a lot of research has been done around performance and recovery in the sports field, isn't there? You know, we know if you're watching a Wimbledon tennis match that they don't play, con- they're not in performance zone all the time. They go back into recovery every um, couple of, of matches, don't they? And, and and then have a bit of recovery and go back into performance. But often we feel in in healthcare that we have to be in on on in performance all the time and we don't put any bits of recovery and maybe this sounds like a pipe dream because i know it's so it feels so overstretched at work but if we can put some micro recovery in during the day it will help us to perform more effectively and not drain our energy so much again another another gp i was coaching they said that i think they'd listened to the podcast and they'd started going off in you know senior partner at lunchtime going off to the local park and sitting under a tree for 45 minutes and Mm -hmm. you know I'm sure most people listening to this are going I I couldn't even do that for five minutes but he genuinely said he he got that time back by efficiency Mm -hmm. in the afternoon just having done that 40 he ate his lunch 45 minutes under a tree made him so much more productive and efficient in the afternoon Mm and I guess it's it's about the rhythm of life isn't it I'm I'm feeling quite connected with nature at the moment because we did our <laughs> You're Not a Frog off grid thinking retreat where we really connect with nature and, you know, learn some lessons for nature. And I think actually <laughs> at one point I actually hugged a tree. It was really mossy. And it was is there really a picture? Soft. There is no picture ever. You'll never see a picture of me do tree hugging, but oh my word, it was lovely. It was soft. And, but nature, you just see nature just does not go Bleh! the whole time. It mm. dies down. It, it comes out again at, in the nighttime. All the flowers go like this, and then it comes out. There is mm. a natural rhythm of stuff, and we are just on the go all the time. So you've got your mm. hourly rhythm where you need your breaks. You've got your daily rhythm. You've got your weekly rhythm, your monthly rhythm, your yearly rhythm. But when the workload expands and expands and expands, the, the rhythm the rhythm just gets cut off. And I, I know, you know, in some religious circles, there's been a lot of talk recently about reclaiming Sabbath or mm-hmm. reclaiming, you know, the, the day off, whatever it is, whatever it is for you. And it does seem that human beings do much, much better when we have that day of, of no work. Yeah. Um, and we it- actually perform better. Mm. I get all my ideas when I'm not working. In fact, I get all my ideas in the shower mainly. <laughs> yes, I think, I think you're not alone with that one. I suppose what what's happening then is you're not your your attentions are being pulled in lots of directions. You're yes, you're just stopping, and it goes back to just being, doesn't it? Mm. And I think I agree that there's a sense of we're probably we are wired to need that time, but we it's so hard, isn't it? I I will hit. I mean, I hear a lot of people probably will be feeling I want to do that, but I can't. As you sort of said, you know, you, someone looked at your diary and was like, you need to get rid of those things. And there's this real sense of I just can't do that. What will happen? And I think we have to really challenge ourselves and go and really, really test ourselves with that because if we continue being overstretched in all areas or in at least three of those corners you know, we will snap at some point. And I was thinking earlier today about the different levels of snapping. So there's kind of loose where the square is kind of, you know, really just, and that's not always good to be completely contracted. There's kind of slack, which is probably where we want to be with a bit of slack. Then there's, I, I put musical because do you remember, did you ever make in, in primary school a guitar using an elastic band oh, and yes. a cork? Yes, 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 I definitely did. Right. So you remember how the elastic band pings at a certain tension. It so does. I was thinking there's a musical tension. I mean, really like that because I'm quite musical. But actually when our stretch is just right, there's a creativity. And you said mm-hmm. about having that creativity when you've got just the right amount of space and time off. And so I just, yeah, invite people to think about where's the right level of tension in stretch in the, in the mm-hmm. band. I'm pulling this metaphor to, you know, all it's all, getting all I can out of it. But 
you know, what, what can you, how do you know what's the right map stretch for you? Because it is different from person to person. And I think there's just something about that. And I love the sense that I know when I'm at my best is when I do have that balance. I don't get it right all the time. And it's ever changing, isn't it? But I I need to I need to have that time, like you said, you know, a day a week. And, and I'm working on that, just unplugging. It shocked me when I looked at my phone and how many times I picked it up. So my attention is being used so much there or my time is being used for that. And so one thing I really did was come off so much social media and simplify, make my smartphone a dumb phone. I know you've talked about that before and unplug because I've left my phone upstairs in a drawer for several hours, one day a week and not missed it and actually not wanted to go back to it. And I would really invite people to experiment with that. Um, Just try unplugging as you did on the grid and and just see what happens see how you feel see how your attention and your energy feels um it's very interesting that I, i've read a book called indistractable by near il and he says that distraction management is actually pain management mm. because why are you picking up your phone it's because it's when you get to a, a place in a task or something where it's just a bit too difficult and you just need a dopamine hit. That's why we mm-hmm. that's why we pick up our phone, not for any other reason. We know we don't need to check our phone. Um, mostly, you know, sometimes we do, but it's mostly just because we, our brains are tired. Mm-hmm. They need that, they need that dopamine. And the problem is it doesn't really help. And it just makes us do more work. We're, we're using work emails that, you know, you get a dopamine hit with any alert that you get, even if it's just an email saying, you know please come for your appointment for this that or the other things so you know I think it's really interesting this whole phone use and yeah Yeah. just not being beholden to it because we think we're missing out don't we and then that that creates more more tension more tension sapping our energy you know it's interesting if you want to bring this analogy of the elastic band even even more I was thinking you know actually if you stretch an elastic band too much I don't know if you've ever put one around your wrist you know when you're little and it was so tight so I started to dig into your arm oh, <laughs> the blood supply you know, yeah exactly and I was thinking mm. when we get stretched too tight we actually become a bit dangerous we come mm-hmm. we come become restrictive to other people and there's all this always a danger that we're going to snap and and fly mm. off um and I was just I was thinking back to a time when I hit a limit and it was completely out of my control, yet I still pushed through when I shouldn't have done. I'm just thinking mm. back to a time when I was much younger, I was a portfolio GP, and I came into my practice and it was 8.30 and the practice manager put her head in the door and said, oh, before you start your surgery, I just got some really sad news. And she told me about a, a GP that had died at the weekend um, on a on a bike ride. It was a well-known GP in the area, but I actually worked with him quite closely in another role that I had. Um, and she, I think she knew and she was being really kind to tell me because I wouldn't have found out until, yeah, probably later, you know. So, And so I got this news, but I don't think she knew about the fact that we spent a lot of time chatting and, you know, we were good friends, mm. even though, you know, we worked in completely different places. And it was really sad. It was really upset, well, as it would be really mm. upsetting. And what did I do? I sat for one minute, called my patient in and did my surgery. Yeah. And looking back on it, I'm, you know, luckily I didn't make any mistakes that I know of. Mm-hmm. There's been no complaints, but I'm certain that I would not have been a good doctor at that point mm-hmm. for that morning because I was really upset. Sure. And what I should have done is probably said actually that's really upsetting I'm not sure I can see any patients for the next Mm -hmm. hour I need to take some time just to sort myself out and I'm sorry you're gonna have to push them back you know rearrange six patients it would have been um and at the time that would have felt really awful I can't I can't do that these I've got to see these patients but actually as a patient do you want to see a GP that's just been told that a good friend has passed away no I don't think you would no I don't think you would no and I don't want to be operated on by a surgeon who has is at the limit of their capacity, is at the, the snapping breaking point. No. You know, we are doing jobs that require a lot of difficult, nuanced decision making. Mm-hmm. And when we are tired and over capacity, that those nuances go that that. Yeah brain power goes and we all know that you know that being tired is like drinking a lot of alcohol and going back to your 
your reasoning actually I think that's a very very good comparison of, mm. of like somebody who drinks a lot of alcohol that doesn't notice when they mm. are under the influence I think it's almost exactly the same because we know that stress and burnout and um being tired has an effect on your brain like drinking alcohol but we are we are so used to we just think it's normal we think it's it's worse to say I can't I can't do this right now because I'm at over capacity mm-hmm. than it is to actually cancel um, a few things. I think that's it, isn't it? When you think about that, that's you know really sad example, Rachel, but it's so true, isn't it? That I think, again, we feel like, no, we should have carried on. So when you got that news, just the surgery was about to start, you probably didn't feel like you had a choice. And we're no. so used to pushing down our emotions, aren't we? Which takes mm-hmm. energy in itself to mm-hmm. do that, to yep. contain ourselves and carrying on and we somehow think that that's strong so there's all of this stuff that we're kind of pushing you know against isn't it it's it's really difficult and I I mean I hope that from what we've talked through today it gives people perhaps some language to use to raise your own self-awareness and just maybe reflect for a little bit on that square and the different limits Mm. and all the things Mm. we've said recognizing where you do have a choice yes there is some stuff that feels like it's not in your control and maybe you don't feel like you have a choice but what do you have a choice over Mm. And then what language can you use? And maybe, as you said, it feels a bit more positive to say, I just don't have capacity for that rather than, you know, I don't, I'm limited or um, I can't do that. Or just saying, again, like if I say yes to that, I'll have to say no to this. And actually, I want to prioritize that. So there's something around language that can be helpful, particularly for those of us who have historically found it difficult to say no for fear of, you know, for feeling guilty. I think that helps when you're communicating that to other people as well or turning down something at work yeah. I don't saying I don't have the capacity for that right now people people get that people understand mm. that but if you start going oh I'm, I don't have the energy or I'm at my limit you know that's a very defensive thing but actually yeah. I'm not have the capacity I think that's a very positive thing yeah I'm just at capacity but then that can I'm sort at- of sound like you know you're at breaking point so I think there's a way yeah. of saying that isn't at there but capacity. sometimes I'm at capacity yeah I'm I'm full you know if, if, when you're doing freelance work it's like actually I'd love to do that but I'm I'm full right now or I'm mm. I don't have the capacity for that but ask me again next next month or whatever and I think there's just something about us having that that kind of mindset shift isn't there and how we see ourselves and shifting from either thinking that we're limited limitless and we don't want to be limited which isn't he- true and isn't healthy or yeah that we can't and we just have to overstretch all those all of that and we'll just have to take the take the flack and actually recognizing again you know what what choice we do have mm-hmm. and so that as you were saying this something's just occurred to me you, you meant you mentioned you know emotional stuff mm-hmm. and I think a lot of the time, the people I really see struggling are people that were, were coping okay, but then stuff is going on at home. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, particularly after COVID, we're seeing an absolute s- massive increase in mental health problems, particularly in teenagers, in children. We're seeing much more school avoidance. We're seeing all sorts of stuff. And I've got some friends who personally have had to take on a huge amount of um, emotional load in terms of supporting their teenage children at mm-hmm. home or dealing with a child who you know is in the middle of being diagnosed with something mm. like ADHD or autism or kids that are just having a hard time at school and stuff and I think we underestimate the amount of time and energy and attention that takes which really impacts on our capacity and don't think we need to make any changes at work and we can just carry on. And time and time again, I'm seeing this, um, particularly yeah. in women, although you, obviously it happens with men as well, that we fail to adjust our square, our elastic mm-hmm. band, to make allowances for the fact that we are having to cope a lot more with stuff that's going on at, on at home mm. for many reasons. Either we don't, you know, we don't like to admit that's going to affect our work or we don't realise how much it is affecting us or we think we should be able to cope or, or whatever. But I think it's really important to say to people, if you have significant stuff going on at home or might be relationship issues or elderly parent stuff, you know, that eats up a lot of your, yeah. your capacity and you might need to change your, what's in your capacity at work yeah. in order to cope with that, right? I think that's the thing, isn't it? I was thinking about the fact that the podcast is called You Are Not a Frog and how gradually, you know, if the if the water is mm. turned up gradually, the frogs don't notice that it's becoming boiling. And I think that's the thing as well, isn't it? That Again, the blunting awareness and a bit like someone who can tolerate a lot of alcohol, but still it's having an impact. Mm. 
perhaps we don't really realize the impact it's having so maybe we do need to take that inventory and often coaching does provide that space doesn't it to take that inventory of actually what is what are the different pressures and the different pulls on your corners of that square and therefore what does that mean to you what does that mean to you what what does that mean in terms of actually how much capacity you do have right now so therefore what might you need to say no to and set some sort of harder boundaries around Mm. and it's it's all about self-compassion it's all about self-compassion you 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 know we we think it's just self-indulgent and you know and I have been called self-indulgent other people might think it's self-indulgent as well um and we do just need to go f it if they're saying that because it's just like actually unless you're okay other people aren't okay and that boiling frog thing you know hadn't thought of that but yes you know you observe people if their child has been in a dreadful accident or they suddenly mm-hmm. diagnosed with a, a cancer or something like that they'll stop work so that they can look after that child yeah. because it's happened very acutely and it's obvious that that's what needs to happen but when it's insidious and it's building up it's building up it's building up you, you carry on going you carry on going you carry on going you don't realize that actually now is the point where I haven't made any allowances at all yeah um and just yeah, just a bit of kindness to yourself. I always just say to people, what would you advise your best friend to do? Such a good what question. Would, because it? it would be so different to what you're actually doing right now. It's such a good question. And often it makes it stops us short and think, well, why wouldn't we do it for ourselves? And just going back to why we sometimes feel a bit guilty when we set boundaries. Often it's because that's the old pattern. Uh, I was talking to someone today and, and and he said to me, yeah, when you feel guilty because you've set a boundary, it's just because you've disrupted an old pattern. Celebrate it. Give yourself a guilt reward, he said, and change the word guilt with a U to guilt with an I, G-I-L-T. And oh, I was like, I oh, I like that. that. Oh. <laughs> because he said, you know, there's guilt. Of course, there's appropriate guilt when you've overstepped a line and you've done something, yeah. you know, that you need to actually correct and, you know, clean up your mess. And I just started checking with myself. Am I, do I actually need to feel guilty? And so I like the change in the guilt to the guilt um, and just think, no, I'm disrupting an old pattern. So it's good. Mm. And the more I practice disrupting that old pattern, I'm feeling comfortable with the discomfort of not being able to do it all. That was another key learning for me, feeling comfortable or as comfortable as I can with the discomfort of not being able to do it all. That's really helped me. I'm going to feel uncomfortable, but how do I become comfortable with that discomfort? And um, I'm working on it. (laughs) Yeah, because lots of people... Um, say I just want to stop thinking this I want to stop feeling guilty I want to stop this and I think sometimes it's impossible to stop having those thoughts because they're naturally inbuilt things and we talked about our amygdalas millions of times on the podcast but it's your it's your brain just trying to protect you Mm. trying to say oh you've got to please everyone otherwise you'll be kicked out of the tribe etc etc so it's not about getting rid of the guilt it's not about getting rid of the feeling of awkwardness it's about acknowledging it and accepting it and I love it turn mm. it into guilt and we always say embrace the guilt in permission to thrive rather than yeah. ditch the guilt because you can't get rid of it but embrace it going yay wow that's my conscience telling me that I would rather not be disrupting that person or disrupting my own pattern but I've decided that's what I'm going to do so yay it's working it's working, it's working. Thank, and it's not selfish no it's just that other people don't probably like the fact that we are choosing to set our own limits and not, no. not necessarily theirs and I think again it is that shift isn't it that just um, yeah recognizing it and and often that guilt like you say it's an automatic thought we can't just stop that but we can choose whether we give it a lot of attention And so again, looking at your square, you can spend a lot of attention. And I certainly can do that kind of like justifying in my head about what I've done. I thought, why am I giving my, why am I giving it so much attention? Just move on. And again, that can be really, really helpful. So we're nearly at the end. And in in a second, I'm going to ask you for your top three tips. But I I have a question because this is something I recognize in myself the other day. And I'm wrestling with this at the moment. It's this feeling of, I guess it's an overblown rescuer of well I've got this massive responsibility that I have to do everything and if someone else says no to me or doesn't do what they should do or have been asked to do whatever I feel massively irritated because I think oh well now I've got to do it I've got to do it or I've got to rescue whatever so I realized that I was unable to hear other people's boundaries and no's mm-hmm. and limits because I struggle with it myself and the more stressed and the more my elastic band is stretched, the less I am able to be empathetic towards other 
people's boundaries and other people's nose because I feel that their nose then mean that I'm going to be more stretched because I then have to rescue and do it for them instead how would you approach coaching me if you had someone like that in the last like in two, two minutes two minutes well I'd probably say what would happen if you didn't so what would happen if you didn't do it when you feel like you have to mm-hmm. and I would also invite you to reflect on the fact that often the thing that irritates us most about other people is something that we struggle to accept in ourselves mm. and so I'd probably just say just a little challenge for you. <laughs> yeah. So I think a lot of the time, um, you know, we are, we do feel like we're the last man standing. We're the only person that can't say no when everyone else is allowed to say no. I think that's a very, very doctory thing because of, well, when, when I was a junior doctor, I just had to do everything that and nobody else wanted to do. That was just, it's your job. You just got to get, you got to suck it up mm. and do it. So yeah, that's interesting. So what is it about that thing that's, that's, um, bugging you that you don't like in yourself yeah and I love that question what would happen if you didn't what would happen if you didn't and how can you accept that in yourself I think that's the thing isn't it so that then you can accept it in other people so I think there's something about that what does it tell you about you and it's not to be judgmental like you said we've got need to be really self-compassionate and show a lot of kindness to ourselves mm-hmm. but often often and I find this really hard but the people I find difficult is because of something not always but because of something that I'm not accepting in myself or I wouldn't accept in myself And so therefore I find it really hard. So I need to make peace with myself first Mm. in order to be kind of Mm. um, responsive in an effective way to them. Yeah. So there's something about perfectionism there, isn't there? I think. Yes. Oh, which, which we need to talk about another time. Another time. Uh, And I know me and you've talked about that before. So, right. What are your top three tips uh, about embracing your capacity? Yeah. Okay. So I think it's around um, one re asking yourself, how much capacity do you have? And that will change depending on what's going on. But really just take a bit of an inventory. How much capacity do you have? And then ask yourself, what do you really want to focus on with your time? How do you want to spend your time, your energy and your attention? And I think the other bit is around, um, I think the musical bit, I know I only just touched on that, but stre- what is your optimal stretch that means that you are, in the, I suppose, just at your best, being your authentic self? being who you really are what's your optimal stretch and again that will change it's a little bit you know it's a bit like your capacity isn't it because your optimal stretch gives you your capacity but actually what when you are acting within your capacity and at your optimal stretch what happens Mm. often amazing things Mm. you know can happen in that and Mm. yeah leaving that leaving that thought with you I really like that and I think probably people have different optimal stretches mm. some people like to be near up uh, yeah stretch. some people really don't don't like it and that is fine totally okay and but I it's think knowing your own some, yeah and I think it's about being non-judgmental about other people's yes <laughs> I've struggled with that sometimes like why are they not like you said like why are they not doing all of x y and z when I can but actually that says more about me and as you say that's yeah it. we all have different stretches and, and I think that's finding your stretch mm. that works for you Oh, so that's been really helpful. I'm going to want to go and think about those for myself straight away. Um, but will you come back and talk to us again? Because I think there's so much more we can oh. explore. I think we've only just tipped the surface of some of those reasons that we talked mm. about perfectionism, guilt, all those things. So we'll get you back to talk about sure. that. I always love our conversations, Rachel. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. And um, so if people want to get hold of you, where yep. can they reach so you? So I am on LinkedIn, Dr. Sarah Coop on LinkedIn. So have a look for me there if you want. That's brilliant. So contact Sarah um, on LinkedIn if you want any uh, uh, Shapes Toolkit courses. Give us a shout. Let us know. Um, we can jump on a call with you to talk about the sort of different training we can do, particularly if you want to explore these sorts of areas uh, with your team, which can be really powerful, actually, to explore together as a team, can't it? Mm. So thank you, Sarah, for thank being you. with us. And uh, look forward to speaking with you soon. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye.